It's Freedom Files with James Burns on American Freedom Radio. Welcome to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon. It is August 11th, 2011. I am James Burns, your host, along with Adam, my network producer, man the helm, back at AFR HQ in Austin, Texas. I'm coming at you live from Shreveport, Louisiana, and we're about to be joined by Bob Chapman, his website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Going to go over a whole bunch of things today, the riots in England, uh, the Dow situation, and uh, much, much more. Without further ado, here is Bob <clears throat> Chapman. Welcome to the show, sir. Well, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I guess the first thing we'll talk about is what's you know, really big in the news over the past couple of days, what's been transpiring in England. And a lot of people have their, their opinions, their theories on uh, why this came about. Uh, what is your take on this? Well, I think the public has had it with the government. And uh, during the course of these demonstrations, uh, they've been infiltrated by people who are professional anarchists, agents provocateurs. And uh, we know we saw them do the same thing in Athens and then again in Madrid recently. And uh, I've talked to journalists uh, in Greece, and they said very definitely that uh, these people were not Greeks and we don't know where they came from. They had masks covering their face, you know, against uh, tear gas, that sort of thing. And so you couldn't see who they were or know what language they spoke. And Madrid saw the same thing, and now you're seeing it in England. So who's paying them? Who's making it happen? I don't know. But there are people who are involved who are starting the fires and breaking into the shops that shouldn't be there. Um, I think uh, people in England are fed up with the economy, the terrible state that the banking community is in, and uh, they're saying to themselves, you know, we didn't do this, and the banks and the wealthy are getting off the hook again, and we got to pay for it. And besides that, now we don't have a job. Inflation's over 12%. And so they're not a very happy group. And for them to demonstrate is understandable. Plus, if you think the loss of freedom is bad in the United States, it's even worse in England. I mean, they got these cameras in every corner, corner in all the major cities spying on people all the time. And uh, they're just fed up with it. And so that, that's what I think the evolution was. Uh, there was one comment I saw from one man who was with a group of about 100 men who were trying to help the police stop the fires and the um, breaking into and stealing things. And he said, you know, this isn't us. We're not doing this sort of thing. We're good citizens. And he's a small, small minority that's doing this terrible stuff. And when the first time they used the police, they were told not to confront these people, which is a little unusual. And then he went on to say, and we're sick and tired of the foreigners running our country. They're not even British. And I had the tape in today's issue under England. It's a link. So if you want to see it, it's there. And I think it speaks volumes. I think the public sees that the royal entourage, who they say are not British, which is true, um, they're sick and tired of them looting the country. And uh, I think it's going to get worse. Uh, they want them out of there. They want, they want the royals out of there. They were trillions of dollars, not billions, trillions. 
And, uh, you know, in days past, because of my being a very large stockbroker and doing business in London and purchases, purchasing South African shares back in the <clears throat> 60s and 70s, uh, I met a lot of these people. And so I know quite a bit about them, they being the royals. And so I think that, that has a good part of what's going on there. I definitely think it's a combination of things. On one hand, you have this, these people in England who are tired of police suppression. They're tired of the government coming down on them, taxing them to death, and, you know, big brother. And on the other hand, like you were mentioning, Bob, there's also this uh, provocateur element, or at least uh, also opportunists, you know, criminals that are just taking advantage of this sad situation to go out looting, uh, smashing shops, carjacking people, beating and killing others. And it, it is sad, though, that, you know, it's obvious it's come out proof that uh, the Met, the Metropolitan Police, not only in London but throughout the, the rest of the country and all the other cities, uh, were ordered to stand down and just stand back and allow these provocateurs, these, you know, you know probably hired hands, <laughs> to go in and uh, wreak all sorts of damage and chaos. And unfortunately, a lot of people are, are sheeple. They, they, they follow suit. They see one guy starting to bash down uh, a shop and start torturing a building. Oh, oh I got to go do it too for some reason. And Bob, what do you think the end result of all this is going to be in England? Well, if the government's smart, they'll turn it into a uh, a uh, a martial law situation. And uh, they did that in Northern Ireland. Uh, whether that'll happen or not, I I don't know. But uh, that probably would be a good me uh, move for them. And. Um, uh, Otherwise, I think it's going to escalate. And they don't have any troops because the troops they do have for the, have for the most part are in some flung, far, far-flung nation like Iraq or Afghanistan or wherever it is. And uh, they get the SAS operating clandestinely in Libya. And uh, so they don't have anybody to protect them. That's, you know, really about what it amounts to. And um, uh, people are really irate about that. I mean, you got, I don't know how many people live in England, but you look at the major cities, and uh, 16,000 police, hardly. I mean, it's just like the police in America. Uh, they're so outnumbered, it's unbelievable. It's the same in England and most other countries. And so they're really not in a position to uh, help people. They're just not enough. And I guess probably they can't arrest people fast enough. I think they have 1,500 in jail or something like that. But they're just not prepared for it either. No, they're not. And um, I, I saw several reports where um, several citizens were uh, calling 999. That's their equivalent to 911 in England. And basically, the police, you know, were telling them just uh, just to hunker down, you know, that they can't couldn't help them or anything, and and you know that's what you you pay for. You pay for the police to supposedly come and help you, but you have a an escalation in citizens, you know, taking matters into their own hands. They've um, well, it's sold out in shops of uh, what baseball bats throughout the uh, England and the UK, and you've had several um, groups, several communities banding together, you know, driving back these rioters. And, you know, at the same time, the government in England doesn't want that. They don't want you to be able to uh, take matters into your own hand and defend yourself. They want you to cower down and get beaten by these criminals while at the same time begging for martial law and troops on the street. Well, I think that's a good synopsis. We don't know at this point what the government involvement is. Was there spontaneity? Did they bring those people in to cause problems? Uh, you just can't answer that because we just don't know. Now, I, I agree with that, Bob, but I think at the same time it, it seems very, very suspicious that this, this whole protest started out peacefully, but then it just sparked and got out of control. And I, I think that you know, before it's all over, I think we're going to find out that the, the government had some hand in this uh, whole you know catastrophe that's taken pe place over the past couple of days in England. I mean, so many. I don't know how many people have been beaten and raped and killed there, but I mean, 
I mean, several cities have been left burning and shops destroyed. I mean, it's just, it's heartbreaking. And I mean, Bob, here's a question. How soon do you think it's going to take for this to transpire and happen across the pond here in the States? It's hard to say. Um, you're going to have 3 million people who are on unemployment checks right now off of them here very shortly. And um, uh, I don't know what these people are going to do. And uh, that number is going to swell as time goes on and until nobody's left on unemployment except new applicants, so to speak. Uh, the government's thinking of cutting back on food stamps and the number of people collecting them grows, what is it, 45 million or so? And um, they want to cut through this new super uh, Congress that they have there. They want to cut Medicare and Social Security to the bone, so to speak. And uh, I don't think the people realize what they're up to. And, uh, and that's another uh, thing that public's going to have to deal with in America. And um, interesting, I talked to someone who was retiring from the police, and um, he's looking for a job. And one of his fellow workers who retired told him that the federal government was under a private contract hiring people and training them to suppress these kind of demonstrations. And uh, so the government expects it. And uh, I told him, I said, I wouldn't take that job because uh, you don't want to get in the middle of that. It's not worth it. And there's a huge difference between what's going on in England and here in the U.S., whereas citizens in England are lucky to be able to get, you know, hammers and baseball bats to defend themselves. We still have the Second Amendment, and I think if it does get to that point where you do have protests and riots in the street of the U.S., it's going to be a, a whole lot bloodier. Yeah, I think you're right, and um, it'll be even worse if they try to take people's guns. And law enforcement, our Homeland Security, our TSA, or whatever it is, that gets in the middle, uh, they're duck soup. I mean, there's no way that they can survive. Uh, it's just a terrible situation for them in particular. So it's it's not good. No, it's not. It's sad because mo most men and women in law enforcement are good people, you know, and, and I have to believe that the bad apples that we hear about are are still – a minority of law enforcement, but at the same time, Bob, you and I both know that that number is growing. I mean, they seem to reward police officers who go out and are, you know, harassing citizens, arresting them, you know, just for filming police officers, uh, becoming taser happy, and and all sorts of mischief that a person would get arrested for and thrown in the slammer if they committed. But it seems to be okay for these guys who have badges. And that's true. Two sets of rules: one for them and one for us, and. It, that, that sort of thing it, uh, appears at all levels. I mean, we see it on Wall Street, corporate America. It's really terrible. I mean, going into court in the United States is, uh, you don't stand a chance. No, you don't, unfortunately. I mean, the deck, the deck is usually stacked against you because most courts no longer even recognize the Constitution or Bill of Rights. I mean, basically, it's uh, nothing more than a kangaroo court, a show trial. Whatever the judge wants to do. It's just sad how far off the, the path that we've, we've gone in this country. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. A lot of things we're discussing right now, how it's all going to be tying into, unfortunately, the future of our country. I mean, I, I see England as kind of like a window for us to see what direction we could uh, end up heading towards, kind of like the ghost of Christmas future. I mean, we look at uh, the stock situation. I mean, last week you were on the show. Uh, when the Dow dropped uh, 512 points last Thursday. Uh, then on uh, Monday, it dropped uh, 634 points. It uh, kind of had a roller coaster Tuesday, and it ended up above 400 points on Tuesday, then back down yesterday to 519 points. And today it looks to be up 
some more points, you know, a little bit. But, Bob, how, how long do you think it's going to take before – uh, the Dow and the other you know markets you know have a real very real collapse. I'm not talking about uh, triple digits. I'm talking about quadruple d- digits, like in the thousands. Well, I think what's going to happen. You know, the, the market was up 400 or so points today, <laughs> and uh, um, I don't know what made it go up. I uh, I can only say it was probably the government. The lack of any news that uh, came, uh, unemployment didn't increase, it decreased very slightly, but that's nothing to write home about. <laughs> and so when you have no real news of any kind, uh, and the market does that, well, uh, obviously, uh, there's another reason. And sometimes we don't know, we've got to guess. Uh, hold that thought, Bob. we we got to go to break. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. More of him coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to the show. You are listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon, August 11th, 2011. James Burns, along with Bob Chapman. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And before the break, Bob, you were uh, breaking down why you think that the uh, stock market has been uh, acting the way it's been acting the last couple, you know, actually the last week, uh, going up, then down, then up a little bit, then down some more. And I, I agree with you about what you were talking about last week, that I think that it's also being done by design. Well, I, I do believe that. And the uh, two days it went up, quite a bit uh, out of the last four uh, were uh, initiated, I believe, by government. And there's been mixed, you know, information coming. And um, so through that chaotic situation, uh, people can say, well, we had uh, this happen and that happened, so maybe it's okay, and that's why it's doing that. But uh, the earnings aren't going to be there. Uh, you're talking somewhere around sixty dollars a, a share in uh, S and P earnings, down from one hundred and thirteen. And we're in a recession, depression, and it's not going to turn around again soon. We're going to have a downdraft, and the Fed's going to be uh, pushed to the very limit, even if they put the money into the economy, which the House and the Senate won't do to keep it going sideways. And they've got to do that, or it's coming unglued. So with the earnings down this coming year, and they may be even worse than I projected, to $60, $70 on the S&P, um, then you've got a reason, a very solid, fundamental reason for market going lower. I see these pundits all day long on CNBC, telling us how the market is fairly priced and all of this gobbledygook. And that's not true. And what's going to happen is the the rallies, which are being supplied by the government, are going to lose their force. And 10,300, 10,500 will be tested I think it's around 11.1 right now, somewhere around there. And, um, in fact, I can look it up while we're talking here. And the the chances are that before the year is out, if I'm right on 10,300 and 10,500, then the next thing to consider is um, where's the next correction going to do? It's 11,143. And I would say 8,500, maybe 95, but probably 85. Now, that's down considerably, probably about 50%, between the recovery of two and a half years ago, which brought prices to to this level where they've kicked around for a long time, this level being 11,800. And so the market could very easily, prior to the end of the year, go to 8,500. What kind of 
events are going to happen in the meantime, none of us know, like more wars or a collapse of the euro or things like that. And that has to be thrown into the soup ball, so to speak. And so we could go back and test 6,550 maybe by next February. And one of the things you got to understand here is a year from November we got elections. And they're not going to have a bad market going into the election. So even if we went down to 6,600, during the course of the year they'd probably drive it back up again by pouring money into it to 10 or 11,000. So these are the changes you're generally looking for. Uh, the antithesis in gold and silver I think will do extraordinarily really well. Uh, this raise in margins of some 22% from 4,500 to 6,000, something like that. Um, that was timed to keep gold from going higher. It's a manipulative process. And the exchange, the CFTC, they do that because most of their members are short and other professionals in the public are long. And they've been losing. So they knocked down gold today at $25. 1760 in round figures. And that's about a $40 cut from where it was. They may go down another 40 Who, It doesn't make any difference. They're not going to keep it down, and they know that. And they will, in the future, raise margin requirements on gold positions. You can expect it. But the people who are buying gold and silver right now, the big hitters, they don't care about their margin. These guys can pay cash. And so it's not going to take them very far. But on the other hand, gold had a, and it had a very strong run here. And it's okay for it to go off 100 bucks. It'll rest, turn around, and go back up. Now, I'm not so sure it'll get down much further because the gold and silver stocks are acting very well. In fact, on average today, uh, they were up. Nothing special. 36 cents, 17 cents, 36 cents, 6 cents, 3 cents, and 74 cents. But that beats being down, and they should be down because gold's off $25. But they're not. And the people who play the share market are far more sophisticated than the people in the commodities pits. At least that's been my experience for more than 50 years. So, the stocks are saying, no, this thing's about to turn around and go right back up again. So what are we looking for? Well, J.P. Morgan Chase, along with HSBC, has a giant naked short position in silver. Came out yesterday and said, gold's going to $2,500 an ounce. I've been at this a long time. When they say that, they don't want gold going over $2,500 an ounce. And they say that it's going to $2,500 an ounce because they think that they know it's going to $3,000 to $3,200 an ounce. That's what that's all about. But you hear have big hitters who are insiders who create inside information, who own the Fed. These bankers, they control the country. Everything. And so when they tell you it's going up, it's going up. And I had up it up until a few days ago projected by the end of February a minimum of 2,000, 2,200, maybe 3,000. So it kind of falls in with my thinking. So that's where I think we're going. Uh, silver will go up a little bit slower because those characters I just mentioned, that are naked short, are naked short big time. And so that means they get serious problems. 
And so they got to fight to keep the price of silver down. They're offside now probably about $35, $40 billion. And at 50 bucks, they're sure they're out out of the cash by close to $100 billion. And if, if it breaks out to 70 or 80 cents on silver, and they haven't covered their shorts, they could go bankrupt easy. So, very exciting times. Indeed. <laughs> Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Bob, I've noticed something over the past couple of days, something of, I guess, kind of an historical <laughs> significance in the uh, metal market. For the first time ever on Monday... Gold was worth more than platinum, and I, I've been following this for years now. And for as far back as I can remember, platinum was always worth way more than gold. What, in your opinion, has transpired to um, kind of cause a, a role reversal there between gold and platinum? Well, first of all, uh, platinum and palladium were, were both very overpriced, and especially overpriced in relation to gold. If anything, they shouldn't. Uh, platinum shouldn't trade more uh, than a hundred dollars higher, maybe a hundred and fifty, than gold at any given time. Um, I think they're going to run close to the same price, and there is some reflection of uh, the problems in commodity markets. You know, they've been in a bull market since 1999. And uh, that's a long time. And the CRB index uh, was uh, higher uh, previously. It got up to close to like 390. And it's trading at 320. And it really should be higher. So I think the play in commodities is a little... uh, long in the tooth, so to speak. And uh, I think that that's part of the reason, maybe a good part of the reason, why platinum and palladium came down and why platinum is selling for close to what gold is selling at. And they'll get golds on the price, too. So they may just run together. It's a hard call to make. And uh, I'm not working on the floor anymore. I haven't done that for 22 years, so my ear isn't directly on the ground. And uh, another thing I came across, Bob, that um, factors into a lot of the situation that we're in right now is uh, that this this came out today, that the U.S. trade deficit has widened to uh, $53.1 billion on expert on the export slump, uh, which is uh, the highest level since October 2008. I mean, when it rains, it pours. Uh, this correction that we're coming into, that began several months ago, is going to be far worse than 2008 because everything's far more negative. Now, one thing we don't have is leverage among banks and hedge funds and others of anywhere between 70 and 200%. Now, the leverage now are probably somewhere between 10 and 30. And so that the big market fallout caused by the contraction of money available for investment, uh, that is not going to exist right now. So we're not going to get some of the, or a good part of the fallout that we saw before. But uh, in the... Um, I just they just handed me a report here. I kind of lost my train of thought there. Um, what was I saying? Uh, you were discuss- We were talking about the um, the fact that uh, the situation now is far worse than it was in two thousand eight. With oh the- yes, right. And you have falling earnings for the S and P five hundred. That certainly doesn't help. You get more debt than you had three years ago by far. And it's not only government; it's individuals and. I mean, look at the figures from last month. They're awful. People are living off their credit cards. People have thrown their hands in the air and say, I can't, I can't do it. I'm just going to spend until I can't spend anymore. And uh, 
I'm sure that uh, that's what those figures reflect that came out yesterday. Um, I think because of that, you get somewhere, let's say by February, the end of February, I think you get somewhere between 8,500 and 10,5 on the Dow, and that's conservative. It could go down to 6,600, but I don't think so because they're going to try to keep it from doing that. So it's not good. And I told you the gold and silver story. Um, there's going to be demonstrations starting next year in the country, and it might even get nasty. I don't think so, but maybe. Uh, we're not... Well, we may be, I don't know, in a situation like England is. I know employment-wise we are. I mean, Greece... Official unemployment, 16%. Yeah, give me a break. Ridiculous. Official unemployment's over 30%. I mean, you got 100,000 taxi drivers who have been striking for three weeks because they want to take their permits away from them to be drivers. And they want to give the contract to a foreign country. It's, it's a very nasty situation. Bob Chapman is my guest. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Your phone calls for Bob coming up right after this. You're listening to Freedom Files on American Freedom Radio. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Freedom Files live on this Thursday afternoon, August 11th, 2011. James Burns hanging out with Bob Chapman. His website, theinternationalforecaster.com. And in the final segment, Bob, how do you feel like taking some phone calls? Oh yeah, that's great. All right, let's do it. Okay, if you want to have, a, if you have a question for Bob, because we do have a, a couple of people on the line already, uh, ask your question, and um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you time to, to you know reply. But we do have a couple of phone calls, a couple of people interested in talking to Bob in the short segment we have left. So feel free and call the show. Area code four zero two AFR twenty five twenty five. That's four zero two two three seven two five two five. And to the phone lines we go. Curtis, you're on the air. Hey, how you guys doing? Hey, Curtis, what's up? All right. Um, I, I'll be quick, and uh, I'll try to be brief. I, I, I don't understand. Well, I do understand, but I, I just think I, I need to make a comment. Uh, the comment that I would like to make is in reference to the disconnect between the middle class, upper middle class, and the lower class in reference to the, the riots in England. And, all, and actually the riots that are occurring uh, all over the world in some shape or form. It's, I mean, I understand the concept that there can be agitators and, and the government can be behind creating some of these riots, but I think one big piece that we're all missing is the fact that the way the economy affects the lower class is entirely different than how it affects the middle and upper middle class. Um, like, just for example, you guys were just talking about platinum and you were talking about gold and uh, lower class people in general don't deal with that. They don't deal with those type of resources. A lot of lower class people live from paycheck to paycheck. Now, when you take that paycheck away and when you, when, when, uh, uh certain political decisions and governmental decisions are made, people lash out. Uh, people, lower class, traditionally lower class people lash out. And when they lash out, they're lashing out not necessarily to march on, on the banker's property or to march on to uh, uh, throwing a particular politician out of office. They're lashing out what they can get their hands on to. And those are the stores. Those are the, 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 the resources in their local communities and, and so forth. I just think I've been hearing a lot of talk radio sort of calling you guys thugs, and, and which they probably are, you know, and I'm not even debating the mor morality of how they're um, expressing their discontent with government. What I'm saying is, is that the way us middle class and upper middle class people deal with our concerns with our government are entirely different than how lower class people traditionally have done it in the past. And that's pretty much my comment. 
Well, it's always been that way. You know how I know that? I'm sorry? I said it's always been that way, and you know how I know that? I was born oh. poor. Yeah, I was. And I know all about the other side of the tracks. I know that every day you get down the corner, you got to fight to stay there. It's survival. Now, on the other hand, in my career, I made millions of dollars a year. So I lived at both ends. And nothing has changed. You have the people at the top using the people at the bottom and not caring about them. And almost every society in the last two or 3,000 years has done the same thing. It's nothing new, and that's why most people don't understand why we're having the problems we're having. We're having problems because we don't understand history. We forgot to read about it. It's all there. And then you decide how you're going to fix the situation if that's possible. And in Europe, we're seeing the edge of anarchy. And we've seen it for the last five or ten years. Back during the late 60s, it was pretty wild there. Now, Will that happen in America? Of course. Because you have this great divergence from the upper middle class and the rich, semi-rich, and the rest of the people. The middle of the middle class and the lower of the middle class is being destroyed. And they're all going to join the people down at the bottom. And when that happens, that brings about revolution. And not only that not ready access through the legal means of addressing your problems, which would be through your senators and representatives. And that's very important because that's what brings revolution about. You've got nobody to say, hey, can't you do something about this? And they're too busy taking their payoffs from corporations. Wall Street, banking, etc. So they're not interested in fixing anything except their pocketbook. It's historical, and we're getting it again. And uh, get ready for it. Unfortunately, that's that's the case, Bob. Curtis, thank you so much for calling. Unfortunately, we have to move on to our next caller. Area code 707. Uh, what is your name, and what question do you have for Bob this afternoon? Hey, Bob. Hey, James. Thanks for taking my call. My name's Jason uh, from California, and my question for Bob is, how come China can have a lower credit rating than the United States, even though they hold most of the U.S. debt, and yet they can threaten to downgrade us? And also, Goldman Sachs is hoarding aluminum, like 25%. They're stockpiling it up in Detroit. And I just wanted your insight on those two things, why China can have a lower credit rating than the U.S., hold all our debt, and yet threaten to downgrade us. Are these credit rating agencies in bed with Congress, obviously? I mean, is this the elephant in the room that doesn't even care it's in the room? Yes. And the rating agencies are controlled by these people. And uh, they always have been. And I know a great deal about them. And uh, for personal reasons, I, I've known people who at one time ran S&P, and that was probably 20 years ago. But uh, I know how they operate, and yes, they're controlled by Wall Street in the city of London. And uh, I could give you a long explanation here that you'd really like, but I don't know that we get the time to do it. Do you have any other calls waiting? Uh, no, Jason's uh, the only one right now, so we got about uh, okay. you got about two minutes. What, what, <laughs> two minutes. What they did, and I'll capsulize this, they could have settled this business of the extension of debt in 15 minutes. What this is really all about is the destruction of Social Security and Medicare. Now, in addition to that, they've implemented what I call a star chamber proceeding a pullet bureau, if you may, most nearly it looks like the Enabling Act of 1933 by Adolf Hitler. And this is what it was all about. And in flies the rating agency, S&P, and says, 
we're downgrading you. Why did they say they did that? Because Congress didn't look like they were going to cut sufficient amounts from Social Security and, and, and Medicare. Now, they also said that by November, if you haven't done what we told you to do, we're going to lower you another grade. This politics of intimidation, like uh, Paulson, when he said, uh, if you don't do this, we're going to have riots and revolution. And they got tar up and everything else and stole all the money. And so that's what you're dealing with here. As far as China's concerned, um, China's right. The, uh, the uh, situation with, uh, with the United States debt, they're right on that. There's no question. It's been like that for years. Uh, China deserves the rating that they have. They got plenty of problems, but downgrade should have came 15 or 20 years ago. It, it was insane all those years. In fact, I projected that correction, that downgrading, a year ago, and I said it would happen in August of this year, for somewhat different reasons than it did happen. But I was right on that. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I think that we, I mean, this, this thing that's happened to the U.S., losing its rating, I mean, this is a long time coming, Bob. Jason, thank you so much for calling the show this afternoon. And we got about a minute left, Bob. Uh, fire off the website. Uh, website, theinternationalforecaster.com. Forecaster is F-O-R-E-C-A-S-T-E-R.com. Uh, you can email us as well if you want a question answered a copy of either the hard copy of the, uh, of the uh, digital copy of the forecaster. Uh, the digital comes out twice a week. The other one comes out twice a month, the hard copy. And uh, you can also get free copies by emailing us as well, as you can get a copy of my latest recommendation in gold and silver shares. That email address is Bob, B-O-B, at int forecaster dot com. Bob at int forecaster dot com. Excellent. And it is a great publication to get. Bob, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I will talk to you next week, sir. Okay, bye bye. There he goes, Bob Chapman, the international forecaster dot com is his website. Subscribe to their international forecaster because that is where you're gonna get the truth, unlike the um, mainstream media propaganda machine.